All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Artelon's uh, webinar on perineal tendon challenges and novel solutions. My name is Aaron Smith. I'm the CEO of the company. Uh, you cannot see me on the camera right now. We're joined by three guest panelists today for the discussion. We have uh, Dr. Mark Purcell from Columbus, Ohio. We have uh, Dr. Dan Kutica from Washington, D.C. and Dr. Stephen Neufeld also from Washington, D.C. To the attendees, if you look at your screen on the right, there are three different uh, modes you can have there. The chat function you can use to share questions or comments with the rest of the crowd. As we go through the call, if you have questions, feel free to submit them through this chat and we will answer all the questions at the end. Uh, as we go through the presentation, there will be some polls coming up. If you click polls, you can see a poll right now. What do you currently use to reinforce perineal reconstructions? Um, we will continue to send those out through the call. And then if you click the handouts tab, we have a number of marketing collaterals, case studies, surgical techniques that the company's prepared. If you would like to download them to your computer or your device to uh, supplement what we're doing, then the download links are right there. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists. On the left is Dr. Mark Purcell. He practices in the Orthopedic Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Purcell received his uh, DPM at uh, Shoal College of Medicine at Rosalind Franklin University, uh, completed his residency at Gunderson in La Crosse, Wisconsin, serving as chief co-resident, and did his foot and ankle fellowship at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center, where he's currently in attending. Uh, he's authored several scholarly publications, was the recipient of the 2013 American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons Manuscript Award of Excellence, and received second place in 2014 and third place in 2016. In the center, we have Dr. Daniel Kutica. Dr. Kutica completed his orth orthopedic surgeon surgery residency at Doctors Hospital and Grant Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. He then did a foot and ankle fellowship at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center, also in Columbus, Ohio. He is a core clinical team member and orthopedic consultant for the Washington Ballet. He's the co-director of the Foot and Ankle Fellowship at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center. He's also a reviewer for peer-reviewed journals, uh, Foot and Ankle International and Foot and Ankle Specialist. Dr. Kutica is an actively involved member of the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and American Osteopathic Academy of Orthopedics. And on the right, we have Dr. Stephen Neufeld. Dr. Neufeld completed an orthopedic surgery residency at The Ohio State University, completed a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at Union Memorial in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Neufeld was the founder of the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center in Washington, the first comprehensive foot and ankle center in the DC area. Uh, their group employs foot and ankle physicians, therapists, athletic trainers, and non-operative podiatrists. Dr. Neufeld serves as the director of the fellowship there. He's a clinical professor in the Department of the Orthopedic Surgery at Virginia Commonwealth University and a clinical instructor at Georgetown University. He's a member of the Inova Sports Medicine Institute and also the founder and director of the Inova, Inova Total Health, uh, I'm sorry, Inova Health Total Ankle Replacement Program. Dr. Neufeld is an editorial reviewer for orthopedic journals, including Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and the Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Welcome to our three panelists. We're glad to have you on tonight. I'm going to go through uh, a couple of very fast slides, just talking about Artelon, uh, the product, and kind of laying out the basic characteristics of it. So Artelon has been in clinical use for over 20 years. Uh, it was invented back in the 1990s by Lars Peterson, a Swedish orthopedic uh, sport, sports medicine specialist who's very well known throughout the world. Um, he developed this material with Paraflodin, who was a biochemist who actually won a Nobel Prize. The product was first commercialized in 1997 and has been used in over 40,000 patients with many peer-reviewed uh, articles from preclinical to animal studies all the way through level one studies with long-term follow-up. So it's a very well-proven material. The, um, the original insight that led to the development of Artelon centered around necrosis. And it was the idea that the body's own tissues, autographs, allografts, in the weeks after surgery, lose a lot of their strength to necrosis. The body needs to break down those tissues before it can rebuild a new tissue. And during that period of time, the strength of that repair can lose 50 to 90% of its initial strength. Um, this generated the interest of supplementing uh, repairs with synthetic biomaterials and ultimately led to Artelon's development. 
if you look at what Artelon actually is, um, it is a medical device. It's approved by the FDA. Uh, it's sterile packaged, stored at room temperature, and can be stored on your shelf, just like any surgical implant. It's made from polycaprolactone-based polyurethane urea. In more simple terms, you can think of it like implantable lycra, like you would see in garments that you wear. It's very resilient, very strong. It's hyper-elastic, can be elongated over 200% before failure, and it's creep-resistant. can be cycled millions of times without losing its shape or its length. The textile that Artelon is uh, made from is very high strength, very good with suture retention, holds the suture very well. Um, it can be trimmed to length without fraying. Mm -hmm. From a biological standpoint, it serves as an excellent scaffold for cells and tissues. It regenerates new tissue through that scaffold by transmitting loads, loads to that developing tissue and uh, stimulating the tissue uh, to develop through mechanotransduction. And Artelon actually does dissolve through hydrolysis very benignly over a five or six year period. So after five or six years, you have a new tissue in its place and Artelon is uh, no longer there. And uh, many of you already know, we have two configurations of it. We sell strips of it in either three millimeter, five millimeter or seven millimeter widths. We also have patches of it, three by four, four by six and six by nine. So the things that make Artelon unique compared to other products or graphs, um, it comes down to the three R's. The first one is it restores kinematics around the joints and in the soft tissues. Artelon's mechanical properties were designed to mimic those of native tendon and ligament tissue. So very shortly after surgery, the patient has a kinematically normal reconstruction. It adds a lot of strength to the repair without changing the stiffness of the repair, and it permits natural motion. The second R is that it resists degradation from necrosis. It's extremely benign. Our preclinical research showed that it's less reactive from a biological standpoint than polyethylene and titanium and a number of other materials that are very common in the orthopedic OR. So it's extremely inert and it maintains over 90% of its strength and elasticity through the first year of healing. Out at three years, it still has 50% of its strength. And the last uh, R is regeneration. By load sharing the mechanical strains with the developing tissue, it permits that tissue to remodel more rapidly, stimulating the resident cells to release cytokines and growth factors that recruit new cells and drive differentiation and the whole biological spectrum that, that eventually leads to a mature tissue. And during that time, it, it's also dissolving in, in water, just like a sugar pill. So when we look at foot and ankle surgery, we have uh, tendons in particular are, are very common usage for this. I would say Achilles tendon is the most described use of Artelon. Um, you see a high level athlete there in the picture who was one of our kind of star patients, but we have a number of uh, high level patients. And there are a number of clinical publications describing the use of Artelon in Achilles tendon reconstructions. Anterior tibial tendon is another good indication. Doctors Neufeld and Katika actually had a poster at AOFAS last year describing a series of patients that had received Artelon in uh, anterior tibial tendon reconstructions. Posterior tibial tendon is another common application. And then finally, the perineal tendons, which we're here to describe tonight. So when you look at perineal tendons, there are four different applications of Artelon that can be considered. One is repair of a perineal tendon that's um, degenerated and, and needs extra strength. One is reconstruction of a ruptured perineal tendon. One is osperineum syndrome after a resection of the osperineum, and one is the superior per perineal retinaculum to uh, prevent dislocation of those tendons. So without any further ado, we're gonna move into our panel discussion. Um, the first question we have, what makes the perineal tendon complex so challenging to treat? I'm gonna start on the left with Dr. Purcell. Yeah, I think that uh, these are challenging problems because they're when repaired, they're, they tend not to glide well, and and they can bind up and there are a lot of scar tissue forms around the area. And so we need to do things that aren't overly intrusive to the area. And that's where a product like this that we can use either centrally with inside the tendon to maintain some of the gliding function as an option, especially in these repair uh, type situations. The other thing is the perineal tendons often end up functioning beyond what their physiologic indication is. They're, they're meant to be dynamic, 
uh, a dynamic structure that helps with eversion in the foot. Uh, whereas most of the time, and people where we see perineal problems also have chronic ankle instability. So we actually end up with a dynamic structure that has to function as a stabilizer. The muscle ends up getting overused, the tendon gets overused, and it creates this degenerative process that elicits pain and causes pain. So a lot of times when we're seeing these, when they're, they're not an acute injury, it's more of a chronic problem and it's related to overuse, uh, secondary to other things. Uh, but still, this is a lot of times the nidus of pain. Excellent. Dr. Katika, anything to add to that? No, I think uh, I think that was an excellent ex explanation. I think the other issue is that uh, just uh, from a more clinical standpoint, uh, just just postoperatively, these patients' perineal tendon surgery uh, tends to be a a uh, relatively straightforward, simple surgery, but sometimes a very deceivingly long recovery. Um, you know, a lot of these patients, you know, um, you know, take a very very long time. Uh, to recover, and then they still have residual pain. They still have uh, res residual soreness, swelling. Uh, a lot of them, and it's been described in the literature, have some difficulty even getting back to just their, you know, high levels of function uh, postoperatively as well. So it can be a fairly, fairly unpredictable uh, surgery, despite um, you know sound technique too. Dr. Newfeld, any uh, comments to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to echo what the other guys said and add a little bit uh, to what Dan was saying. Um, the, the recovery is challenging for these patients. And um, there's always a, a, a challenge when you're in surgery, how much suture to use, how, how difficult, you know, how much, uh, how strong a repair you need. The stronger the repair, theoretically, you can move them sooner. But up until now, that's required strong suture like Ethabon or fiber wire, where you're really putting a lot of bulk into a very small area. And if you have too much bulk, uh, that's gonna cause trouble. You're gonna get more impingement, you get more tearing, you're gonna get more stiffness and difficulty to repair it. So that, that's the first challenge is, is a balance of how strong a repair you can achieve, but keep the area relatively thin and decompressed. Um, and then the second, the second challenge is, we don't really have great guidance on how much of the tendon you can debride. You know, some people say you can read if you have more than 50%, you might as well do a tendon transfer. Uh, some people say just repair it. it Tubularized, we don't really have great prospective studies comparing different techniques. So when you're in there and you look at a tendon, it's difficult to know, well, how much can I cut away? How much of this degenerative tendon can I leave? And how much do I need to cut away? Um, so it, it's always a, a game that you're trying to figure out when you're in surgery. Excellent. So let's move to the, uh, the pre-op planning process for these injuries. Um, patient comes in complaining of you know, presumably lateral ankle pain. Um, why don't we start from the right and move to the left this time. Dr. Newfeld, tell me about the workup on your patient and how you kind of narrow in on a diagnosis and get a surgical plan. <clears throat> sure. Well, the first thing is you inspect the patient. You have them stand and have them walk in front of you. So you're looking for deformity. You're looking for a, a varus deformity or a valgus deformity, like a cave of varus foot and that will lead you down one path. Obviously, you do a physical exam and their strength and, and uh, nerve function. Is there any serial nerve problems or uh, you know, other, other nerve types of problems? So you're doing your basic physical exam. Assuming that there's no structural obvious deformity and there's no neurological deformity, and then, you're, then you examine the lateral side of their foot. So you're testing eversion, you're testing your ankle instability. Sometimes subtle instability can cause pain as well. You try to isolate where the pain is coming from. So if the pain is uh, retro fibula or behind the fibula, you're thinking maybe it's perineals uh, or sore nerve. If it's down by the calcaneal cuboid joints or uh, you're thinking maybe there's an osperineum injury, sinus tarsi, you're thinking maybe there's a subtalar joint. So, you know, first you do a physical exam and you try to isolate the area. And then uh, we move on to any sort of radiographic images. So standing foot x-rays and ankle x-rays is, is the beginning of the workup. Dr. Kadeka, how often are you using other imaging modalities like CT and MRI in these patients? Um, you know, fairly frequently. I'll do it, especially um, if uh, for pre-op planning purposes. Um, I, I will usually favor MRI um, because that will, you know, give me an idea in terms of uh, the state of the perineals, how much tendinosis. Um, you know, and the complexity of tearing if there's one or two tendons torn as well. Um, 
I think also MRI is, is, is kind of helpful, especially in these people with very, very large tears. You can sometimes look at the perineal musculature and see if there's any atrophy or not. And then that'll give you an idea of how well, uh, you know, if they're, it, how well functioning the muscle is. And if even an allograft reconstruction, if you get to that point, it is possible. Um, you know, CT, if it's more of a deformity correction, um, you know, I'll typically use a weight bearing CT scanner uh, to help me with, uh, with, with planning as well. Um, you know, the other kind of modality I think that's often helpful for instability is just ultrasound. I mean, that's more, you know, that's more of a dynamic problem. You know, ultrasound uh, is, is um, you know, it will, is a dynamic uh, imaging modality, and you can usually see if there is any, any perineal tendon instability there. Excellent. Dr. Prizel, you had mentioned kind of comorbidities with this and kind of etiology behind perineal pathology. When you're working these patients up, how often do you see comorbidities? What other... Co issues around the foot are common with perineal tendon pathology? Sure. I think a couple of them were kind of mentioned uh, what was already said, uh, cable varus foot type, understanding deformity when it's present. A lot of times we see issues with the perineals in that patient. Uh, in the flat foot patient, though, too, you see a different type of problem. You can see spasm, but that also can be degeneration that can be painful of the perineals. And then I think the most common one is uh, lateral ankle instability. That's the one that we really see. You know, whether it's a true, um, a true full-on instability or whether it's a more functional instability, both of those can present problems for the perineals. Excellent. So let's move on to our first uh, clinical indication, using Ardalon to supplement a repair of a perineal tendon that's degenerated or attenuated. Um, Dr. Kutica, let's start with you this time. Uh, during these procedures, when do you feel that augmentation is uh, indicated with these patients? Well, I think, I think historically, uh, you know, we were always taught, you know, if there was more than 50% degenerative tendon, then that was the time you should, you, you should think of some other procedure other than repair. Um, and, you know, oftentimes that was a tenodesis. Um, you know, I, but I, you know, I think that 50% number was, it was really an arbitrary number. I don't think there was really any, any real good sound research behind it. Um, so um, um, really, I think I, I would, you kind of want to, you know, when you repair these tendons, um, I will even go, you know, stretch beyond that 50% uh, and try to preserve as, you know, as, or try to use whatever normal tendon there is and then augment that um, usually uh, with an allograft. Um, I'll try to steer away from tenodesis at this point just because you don't have a balanced foot. Um, and I think uh, allograft kind of restores your uh, muscle tendon unit a little bit better um, as long as there's muscle excursion and, uh, and, restore function of your, uh, of your perineal, uh, perineal tendons. So most of these patients have a more balanced foot and, and hopefully a better, better result. Great. Dr. Neufeld, tell us about tenodesis. You know, what's a uh, compromise you think come with the tenodesis? Is there functional impairment? Is there pain? What, what would be reasons to consider something as an alternative to a tenodesis? Right. Well, first of all, I'll be honest with you. I, since I've been using Ardalan, I haven't done a tenodesis in, in a, I can't remember the last time. Uh, I want to. I want to revisit that thing I mentioned before with the, with the debulking of the area. When you do a tenodesis, it requires you to sew these tendons together, which uh, really creates a, a big bulky repair behind your fibula. So I think that's a problem. And I, I've seen patients postoperatively get very stuck and uh, with little excursion. You don't know how strong the residual muscle is and if it's really going to work very well. Um, you think it's going to work, but in the post-operative period, you find out sometimes that there's really no excursion, there's really no muscle strength. So I think what you're th you think is going to be an active tenodesis turns out to really be just be a static tenodesis. You might as well, you know, put something else in there that uh, is acting in the same manner. Um, you know, the perineal longus uh, is needed if possible, um, and if you sacrifice that, theoretically, long term, you're going to have troubles with um, with deformity. And I don't think you ever really regain your strength back with the tenodesis. So um, I, I try to stay away from that if I can. Great. Dr. Prizel, why don't you describe your surgical technique when using Ardalon to augment these repairs? Yeah, so the obvious, uh, the obvious place that this is happening is the split tear in perineus brevis most commonly is what we're talking about from this. And what was said earlier is true. Sometimes they're retrofibular. Uh, what I see a lot of is ones that are actually around the perineal tubercle, too. You get a lot of irritation and rubbing against the perineal tubercle. 
Um, and so yeah, really understanding what part of the tendon is torn and how extensive it is is really important. Um, to what Dr. Kudika said earlier too, using MRI for this, what I found is sometimes these are actually undercalled on MRI. So having something that's available on the shelf, uh, like Artelon, that's there to use, sometimes you get surprised and the tendon is more damaged than you think. Um, so I, I like having it around. Uh, from a surgical standpoint, uh, it's kind of an oblique, somewhat linear approach. you got to be a little careful for the sural nerve. You dissect through those tissues carefully. Um, expose the correct segment of tendon. Uh, be cognizant of your SPR if it's up in the retrofibular area. Sometimes you need to release part of that. I always try to tag that when I release it because sometimes that's thin, relatively wispy tissue, and it can be hard to find when you're sewing things back up. Identify the area tear. I'll usually do that with a blunt instrument, like a freer first to really define the tear and to help differentiate normal tissue, uh, healthy uh, linear tendon fibers from the degenerated mucoid degeneration type uh, tendon derangement that we normally see in these split tears. Uh, I'll debride out the split tear. Whatever tendon doesn't appear healthy, I remove. And that's where something like Artelon can be helpful is I can go north of that 50% without having to go to a tendesis. And so if I only have 20 or 30% of healthy tendon left, I'm still comfortable uh, with that. So I debride until I have normal tendon and the full length of the tear and sometimes even a little bit beyond. Uh, when I'm using Artelon, what I what I like to do if possible is I use it as almost as a central core uh, for the repairs. I tend to use the three millimeter strip most commonly and I'll circumferentially sew that um, within either using a running lock stitch or something. I tend to use uh, like a PDS, something that's gonna be around for a while, has some durability to it, but that's ultimately gonna go away. It's kind of some of the same theory about why Artelon is what it is. It's there for a while while it needs to be there and then it goes away. Um, I think some of the other absorbables for me personally, I, uh, like a Vicryl or a, a Monocryl, they absorb a little too quickly and they lose some of their integrity a little too quickly. Um, so, and I try to, um, like Dr. Neufeld said, I try to keep the caliber of the tendon relatively anatomic. And that's where I think the three millimeter core as opposed to using the five millimeter strip has been more successful for me for the uh, split tear type repair. Great. Doctors Kudika and Neufeld, from a technique standpoint, anything you guys do differently, uh, methods of fixation, suture type, uh, anything? Uh, I kind of done both. I've kind of done the the inlay or, or the or the onlay uh, methods, um, and I think both work work well. I think the key is um, uh, to reiterate what was said. You just don't want to add a lot of bulk. Um, the other nice thing is that, well, I don't think Arbalon does add a lot of bulk, um, you know, like an, like a true allograft, like semitendinosis um, along those lines. Um, and it's also, you know, one of those things that has a nice long shelf life. So you can request it. Um, you don't necessarily need to use it as opposed to, um, you, know, an, you know, like a cadaveric graft. Um, Great. Yep. I, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with uh, Mark's use of PDS suture. I think it's a smooth gliding suture that will dissolve. Uh, the only thing, other thing I'll add is I always I try to do a buried knot technique, and I try my hardest to put the artelon in the central portion of the of the uh, perineals, and I'll, I'll wrap the perineal brevis around the artelon as a central core. Great. Presumably, you guys do that so that, to leave a good gliding surface behind the fibula, so when the tenant has excursion, it has no irritation. Exactly. Yes, correct. Got it. Okay, let's move to our second of the four indications. So this would be reconstruction for a rupture. Dr. Neufeld, why don't you describe how you've seen Artelon used in this setting? Um, well, I feel very comfortable attaching one end of the artelon to one end of the rupture and the other end of the artelon to the other end of the rupture. Usually you can have some excursion of the, of the uh, torn tendon. Um, again, I, I try to leave as much, even if it's degenerated, I try to leave some biology behind, but use the artelon as the core strength. So I'm not, I'm not as concerned. I'm not running lots and lots of sutures and and you know, some of the old ways we used to fix perineals and used to fix Achilles with running fiber wire sutures layer after layer after layer. So you end up basically making a rope out of your tendon. Uh, nowadays, I'm, I'm less, less suture, but more Artelon. So uh, I'll try to find some remnants of the, of the ruptured tendon and wrap it around the Artelon as best as possible. But even if there is no tendon in some portions of the mid area of the Artelon, I'm not too concerned because with my strength, 
uh, fairly reliable, both proximally and distally at the an uh, anastomoses, I start early motion. And I think that over time, I've never gone back and looked at these, you know, six years later, but I think from our science studies that we can assume that if that tendon is, if that artery is functioning as a tendon by six years when it's dissolved, there'll be some sort of tendon that has grown in place. So Great. It, it, it gives me, it gives me a lot of uh, uh, security to let them move soon. Great. And Dr. Preisel, just tell us about the mechanical characteristics of an Arnalon strip and how it feels in your hands when you're using it for this type of you know, demanding mechanical uh, situation. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. And it, it, it is something It has pliability to it, uh, but it also is very elastic. It very much comes back to its original position. You can try to manipulate this any way you can in the OR. It soaks for a few minutes before you use it. And then you can stretch it and it bounces right back and you can do that repetitively like you said early uh, from your uh, from the science portion of this but uh, from a clinical standpoint i've experienced that every time i've used it um, the interesting part is the question of do you tension or don't you tension this when using it for a tendon repair i when using it for the perineals uh, like we're talking about with the core technique like we just were i don't really tension it at all if i'm using it in a you know, uh, where there's actually a gap, if I'm using it like a jump graft or, or something like that, I will actually, when I'm sewing it together, I'll try to restore some of the tension to keep function on the muscle belly. And so I actually, you know, you can stretch this pretty hard. I mean, you said 200%. I don't think I've ever been successful getting it that far. Uh, that's more mechanical strength than I think we're going to see out of any of our tendons. But I will try to take a little bit of that initial um, pliability out of it to try to engage the muscle a little bit more for that early motion that we're trying to achieve in these patients to keep the muscle fibers functioning and going. Um, so, you know, I, there's no perfect science to this, but what I normally can stretch it, I may be for the, the reconstruction patients, I'll take about 50% of it out where I don't normally do that in the repair cases where I'm using it centrally within the core. Great. Dr. Kutika, what size of Artelon strip would you typically use for a case like this? And any tips you have for us uh, in getting it under tension? Uh, well, I, I think a couple things. I think first, uh, as far as size, um, I, I think a lot of it depends on the size of the defect. Majority of the time, your eight millimeter uh, uh, graft will be large enough, or excuse me, the eight centimeter uh, uh, will be large enough or plenty of length. And then I'll typically do a 0.5 uh, uh, centimeter, uh, just to, because you, again, you don't want to add a lot of, a lot of, a lot of that bulk. Um, you know, as far as uh, you know, how to tension it. Um, uh, typically, with these uh, reconstructions, I will uh, secure uh, the artelon distally. Um, I'll try to debride as much, you know, you know to as much healthy tendon as you can, but I'll secure it to the distal stump. Um, if you need to, you could, uh, as often times, you can secure it to your fifth metatarsal base as well if there's not much stump. Um, and then, as far as when I tension it, um, you know, kind of hold the foot um, in neutral dorsiflexion, uh, neutral inversion, eversion, maybe to slight eversion um and then i will um essentially just yeah you just kind of you know pull about 10 20 I, i'll usually only do about 10 to 20 percent um, um tension in these cases but i'll also pull the muscle belly uh a little bit distal so i get a little tension from that end too and and then secure it uh that way um i'll usually just do a side to side uh, uh you know kind of repair and, and ensuring that there's enough overlap you know you Probably want about a centimeter of overlap, uh, tendon graft overlap. Um, you can do a pulver taff weave um, as well. That's that's certainly an option. I'll ask a general question. It applies to all four of our clinical indications. Do any of you guys consider the use of biologics? Since these are degenerated tendons, do you use any regenerative products or bone marrow or PRP or anything in combination with these repairs? Um, I'll answer that. Uh, first, I just wanted to to revisit, uh, just reiterate what Dan was saying. Um, I think it's a great technique to anchor the artelon into the base of the fibula. I'm sorry, into the base of the fifth metatarsal. Um, it, it holds suture extremely well. You can either use an anchor, which I've done in the past where the, if the rupture is distal, I'll put an anchor in the base of the fifth and I'll, I'll secure the artelon to that and overlap with the tendon itself. As far as biologics go, um, not routinely. Um, I, I think uh, if I'm going to do anything, I'll take some Bmax and bone marrow aspirate and concentrate it and, and possibly soak it in Ardalon. Um I used to use some amniotic tissue, but I found that it probably didn't make a difference anyway. Great. Dr. Prezel, Kedika, any differences on biologics? 
Uh, very similar. I've, I've soaked uh, the Ardalon in, in, in Bomar Aspirate, um, and that's probably the extent of it at, at this point. Same. Uh, BMAC only, and I uh, haven't tried anything else. I don't routinely do it, though. Okay. Dr. Neufeld, take us through your post-op regimen for these patients, and is there any differences for how you would treat a, a complete rupture with a reconstruction as compared to a, a debridement of a, you know, a chronic patient? Sure. I, th this has been an evolving uh, process for me. At, at for, you know, before I used Ardalon, these patients were casted when I first started this 20 years ago. And then we slowly moved to a boot and start some early motion once the skin is healed. But I'd be, I was very, very conservative on getting the motion because I was, I was worried that uh, we would tear the repair. I, I think for uh, now, I don't really differentiate as much between the complete rupture reconstruction as a uh, repair of just the brevis. I treat them almost the same if I get a good repair interrupt, which I would say the majority of the time you do. Um, like uh, we talked about the with the uh, technique, if you anchor it in distally to the base of the fifth metatarsal, that, that is a really very, very strong repair. And you get a nice repair proximally. Uh, as long as my SPR is repaired and those tendons aren't subluxating, I'm very aggressive on my uh, rehab. I let them walk on it right away, at least when the skin is healed. And we start early motion uh, once the, the tissue has calmed down, the swelling has calmed down. Great. Dr. Kedica, does the addition of Ardalon change your thinking at all when it comes to um, post-op care or rehab for these patients? No, I think it definitely does. I think, uh, you know, one of the things uh, it does is it kind of, you know, it essentially protects your repair um, and, you know, it, and, and allows things to heal. So I think it allows you to be a little bit more aggressive with, with uh, these patients. Um, even in these, uh, in these cases, I, you know, I'll, I'll cast most of these patients most operatively just for a short period of time, but I'll, I'll let them wait there um, on it. Um, but it, then I, I think, you know, by once their incisions healed, usually week two, week three, we'll, we'll begin early range of motion. Um, and then oftentimes uh, I do think their recovery is a little bit uh, 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 quicker because of that. You know, they don't get all of the muscle atrophy and all the other potential problems uh, that, that can develop from being from a prolonged period of non weight bearing, um, you know, and, and, and things like that. Excellent. Dr. Purcell, when you followed your patients after perineal um, reconstruction, you know, it is a sensitive part of the foot and, you know, a concern that people often have is adding a new biomaterial to that reconstruction. Have you seen anything in your patients that gives you cause for alarm or concern or do they do typically as well as the other patients or even better? You know, I think that, um, I think when you get a sound repair, that helps in itself decrease the inflammation and the swelling in the area. I, I can say that I haven't seen any instances where I've seen a, a larger inflammatory response using this this uh, product or anything like that. And I agree with the, with what the other guys say that, uh, you know, I can feel comfortable getting them more aggressive. Uh, the interesting thing is it's, it's difficult to say if they actually do better because I probably bias these patients toward getting through the rehab process a little quicker. And so I'm pushing them a little bit harder. So if I'm saying they're, I'm, they're swelling the same, but I'm actually pushing them harder, they're maybe swelling a little bit less, but I don't know that that's exactly scientific, so. Sure. Dr. Skedica and Neufeld, do you agree with that general idea? Um, I do. I, you know, I, again, I, I think because we are a little bit more aggressive, um, you know, they, they definitely do seem to do better. I don't, um, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you some of that is because, uh, you know, we're protecting, reinforcing the repair. Um, some of it you can probably attribute to the early rehab, but I think you can be confident uh, that you can rehab these patients uh, much, much earlier um, and not have to worry about compromising your repair. I agree, and I think it gives the patient uh, uh, security also that they'll push themselves harder. Uh, I've, I've not seen any troubles with pushing them and getting more aggressive, and I think, the re I think that the um, rehab is better and quicker. Great. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, osperineum <clears throat> reconstruction. Um, maybe start with you, Dr. Kataka. Tell me about your uh, surgical technique here and how you consider the addition of Ardalon to these uh, cases. So uh, historically with uh, your Osperonium, um, you could really tackle it one of two ways. I mean, one is you can just completely excise, uh, you know, the os, the os um, you know, 
from you know kind of cutting through the tendon distally, cutting through proximally, just completely excising it, which leaves you with a big defect. Uh, the other way, you just shell out uh, your osperonium. Um, either way, you end up with some sort of defect. Even when you shell it out and try to preserve some of the integrity uh, of the tendon, you're not left with much. Um, so, um, you know, this is a you know a, I think a great great indication for Ardalon. Um, as far as technique goes, I'll, um, before I even shell out the um, osperonium, I'll I'll secure uh, my Ardalon graft distal to it just so I could kind of capture that distal end, have control of it. Um, because it's, uh, it can, uh, that, you know, it's right at your cuboid just tunnel. So it can, it's very, very easy to, for that distal tendon segment to get lost. So I'll kind of capture it. I'll shell out, uh, the osperonium, uh, repair whatever defect. And then, um, and then, uh, again, bridge that, uh, with my Ardalon proximally. Great. Dr. Neufeld, how often are you successful kind of shelling out the osperoneum as opposed to just segmentally taking it out and trying to work end to end? Uh, almost never. It's very, very difficult to do that. You could shell it out, you leave a, a sort of a whisper of a, of a tendon around it. Um, so before I even do that, as uh, Dr. Kodak was saying, I secure uh, my Ardalon distally. Uh, I've been using something like a scorpion suture passer or some way to get deep into the cuboid tunnel where I I pass some sutures and I attach the article on to the distal perineal longus so that I have control over it. Then I shell out the os perineum, bring the ends as close together as possible. And that inevitably, there's a gap that is filled just with a piece of Ardalon and then secure the Ardalon more proximally as well. Great. Dr. Prezel, the images we have here, it looks like this is, uh, they're using the wider strip that we have, the 0.7 strip. Any thoughts on sizing and how it relates to the defect that you're treating yeah when i've done this i've used the five millimeter strip uh personally i do this i actually do as an onlay rather than an inlay centrally i try to shell it out if i can uh i've uh what i haven't done is what, what these guys are talking about is securing the distal stump which i think i'm going to start doing that makes a lot of sense and if, if once you lose that piece it's kind of gone um so i i've done a five millimeter uh strip shell it out and then try to get some deep stitches in there afterward which which uh, technically is a little bit more challenging so i think it makes a lot of sense to secure this first and then uh what dr kataka said earlier about having at least a centimeter on the proximal side i try to have that on the proximal side it can be difficult to get that on the distal side just because you're really down in the bolt of the foot um, but for me it's usually five millimeter and obviously for this technique typically the eight centimeter length is is plenty Great. I use, I'll add one more thing to that. I would add, you could use a urology needle, a UR8 needle, which has a very uh, sharp curve to it. Yep. So you can really get in the, in the hole. Great. Perfect. Dr. Kataka, inlay, onlay, whatever you can get away with. Um, in this case, onlay. And yep. I think it's really hard to do an inlay here. Great. Any differences here with post-op care and rehab regimen from what we've already talked about? Um, you know, Not for me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I think again, you, I would be just as aggressive with this. Yeah. Again, I, I really think this Ardalon has been a game changer where it, it takes what previously were complicated problems that had difficult rehabs and, and kind of equalizes it. Cause now you're, 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 uh, allowing the strength of the Ardalon to, uh, take the majority of the work for you. Great. Okay, let's move on to our fourth uh, indication, superior perineal retinaculum. Dr. Prizel, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, just prevalence here? Um, obviously, the you know, underlying pathology is sub subluxing uh, perineal tendons. How often is the retinaculum uh, implicated, and how often do you feel it needs repaired, period? Yeah, so if you rely on imaging alone, uh, this is probably undercalled quite a bit. I think this is a clinical diagnosis as much as anything else. Uh, it's a dy this is as dynamic as it gets. I think uh, I don't personally use ultrasound for this, but I think it's a great indication. If you either um, are very comfortable with ultrasound yourself or you have a good MSK radiologist that can help you out um, that, that likes to do it. Um, but it's a dynamic uh, subluxing. They snap in and out from around the fibular groove. And the likelihood with an MRI that you're going to catch the tendons while they're out, unless they're chronically dislocated, is pretty low. Um, so you have to have a clinical suspicion for this. Um, I'll kind of have uh, patients dorsiflex and evert their foot to try to feel them snap around. 
people will report these snapping kind of symptoms. And so I think if you're looking for it, it's actually pretty common. Uh, when I'm dissecting out for uh, perineal tendon pathology, what I'll notice is if I stick a freer uh, from the distal aspect of the fibula up into the perineal retinaculum, there's often a lot of space there. And intraoperatively, if you start ranging the foot, a lot of times you can get the tendons to sublux. So I think it's something we need to be a little bit more cognizant of, and it's probably underappreciated. Great. So Dr. Newfeld, uh, you know, one thing I've observed in these cases is that that retinaculum is a pretty mobile structure. You know, if you, as the ankle goes through dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, there's quite a bit of stretch there. How does um, Artelon's characteristics, you know, sort of complement the, the need to reconstruct this? Sure. Well, inevitably, when you get in there and you're looking at your retinaculum, there's lots of soft tissue left because as those tendons have subluxed over time, uh, the retinaculum stretches out. So you're, you're left with a lot of redundant tissue and it's, you could be fooled and think, oh, we have so much tissue, I'll just tack it back on and uh, it should be fine. But, but the tissue is weak. You know, it's, it's, I haven't done a biopsy and looked under the histology, but it's definitely thinner and it's, uh, it's sometimes mucoid and it's not healthy, strong ligament that you would normally see in a healthy uh, person. So while you have biology, which I like, you don't have the strength, which is really what you need. So um, I think the Artelon is a nice adjunct to it because it's adding your strength as well as some flexibility that is necessary along with the biology there. Great. Dr. Kudica, how often do you do this in conjunction with the fibular groove deepening and to walk us through your surgical technique? Uh, well, I'll, I'll do it with or without the groove deepening. I think it, it depends just on the groove. I mean, I, I think every uh, time you're assessing instability, um, you, you got to check the groove. I think the majority of the time, as long as they have that nice fibrocartilaginous lip, um, you know, then you probably don't need to go ahead and proceed with your groove deepening. The other thing that's important with these is you, you know you look for sometimes you have crowding of your uh, uh, of your uh, tunnel here. So do they have a low line um, brevis muscle belly? Do they have a uh, um, perineal cortis or, or quintus? Um, you know as well that needs to be excised. Um, so those are kind of uh, things things to look for. Um, I think this SPR. You know, obviously, it's going to be your main restraint, though, and I think that, you know more so than the than a group deepening. Um, as far as um, you know, how and you know how we repair these, um, you know, in terms of uh, I I will repair the SPR, uh, you know, kind of in standard fashion, and and there's many ways to do it. I mean, you can leave a little cuff of uh, your SPR on the fibula and and just do a pants over vest. You can do drill holes through your you know, postlateral fibula or even even anchors. Um, when I when I add Artelon to it, um, you know I'll, I'll typically place one anchor just at that posterior lateral aspect of the uh, fibula, um, secure my Artelon, and then um, at my second anchor I'll place uh, uh, just kind of inferior and slightly posterior to the to the tip of the fibula into the calcaneus, um, and kind of your trajectory it should be uh, uh, relatively parallel to your CFL because your SPR your native SPR is parallel to your to your CFL. Uh, which is oftentimes why you can have injuries to it. But um, 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 but I'll place that second anchor into the calcaneus. Um, and again, I do uh, add a good uh, bit of tension to my Artelon here. You don't want it to be lax. Obviously, you don't want it to be too tight either. Um, um, so you just want you want to make sure your uh, tendons are gliding nicely uh, before you cinch it down. Great. Dr. Newfeld, anything to add uh, from a technique standpoint? Um, I tend to use a drill. I tend to take a 6-2-K wire, a small drill, and I drill multiple holes in the posterior lateral fibula. And as I pass my sutures through the tunnel, through the SBR, I overlie the artelon on top of that. So I usually have, uh, if you could picture, the groove, the tendons, the SBR, and then the artelon, and that's all together with uh, the suture. Excellent. So just uh, in broad strokes, you know, after you've treated these patients, you know, talk about wound healing, tendency to retire, re-rupture, uh, concerns for neuralgia with the sural nerve or ner nerve injury, and, you know, use, like what you were just saying, subcutaneous use and tendency for scarring and adhesions. Have you guys really seen any issues here or is there anything that, uh, you know, gives you concern as it pertains to Artelon with these issues? I, I would uh, I would actually say the alternative. I would say that with Artelon, I can keep the repairs less bulky, 
uh, to allow some uh, excursion of the soft tissues, and I have less. I would think I would have less problems than before. Excellent. Being able to mobilize a little bit earlier is helping with regard to uh, risk for scarring and adhesions. I haven't personally seen any re-tears, wound healing, and uh, I think you're, you're close to the sural nerve, but I haven't seen any increased incidence using this product. That's typically transient, and massage techniques through therapy help that go away afterward. It's easy to counsel patients on. Let them know ahead of time, though. That's what's helpful. Um, and and I, I would uh, you know concur with the uh, with uh, Stephen uh, Mark um, just to kind of along those lines we kind of uh, our, our our groups um, kind of looked at just you know is there an increased uh, risk of these potential wound complications um, you know scarring adhesions foreign body reaction with the Artelon and and we'll, we're presenting that you know you know in the future at the uh, you know fall meeting the OFS, OFAS fall meeting but we found no real significant incident or, or change. Um, or, or increase incidence. So it's, a, you know, a very, very safe, um, you know, um, um, thing to use. Great. And it's probably worth pointing out that in all the published clinical research and various indications, it's, it seems pretty consistent there that you don't see rates of complications or adverse events that are any greater with autographs or, or local tissue. So, okay, concluding thoughts. So, Gentlemen, how has Artelon's FlexBand helped improve your treatment of perineal issues? Um, maybe start with Dr. Neufeld. Well, two two ways. Number one, I think it's become it's turned in all these complex problems into an equal problem, uh, where I'm I'm confident that my repair, no matter if it's an osteoperineum or rupture, or reconstruction, a tear, uh, I think as long as my Artelon is in there securely, then I treat them all about the same, uh, and I've accelerate my rehab and feel more comfortable moving them sooner, which reduces adhesions and post-op stiffness and uh, better outcomes. That's a great point, is driving towards uh, consistency of outcomes. Dr. Prizel, you think there's any differences here from the patient's experience standpoint? You talked about early motion. How important do you think that is to them? I think it is important. I mean, everybody, I tell all my patients, it doesn't, if I tell you two numbers, you're only going to hear the lesser of the numbers uh, typically. And I think uh, where this is really different for them and where it's really impacted them is it helps them see a confident surgeon looking across the room at them, telling it's okay to go and it's okay to start. You can wean away from your ankle brace. You can start pushing it a little harder in PT. Patients tend to really respond well to us. And if we can be more confident and we can tell them that we feel that they're on track or they're ahead of track, they feel great about that. And that does help relay a positive experience to them. Excellent. Dr. Katika? Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I would agree with uh, both Mark and Steve again, but I think, the, I think the biggest thing for me is I can get these patients moving quicker. Um, I can be very, very aggressive with the rehab like we've, like we've talked about. Um, I do feel like these patients do better, especially with perineal tendon issues. I think that, that kind of unpredictable prolonged post-operative recovery um, is a little bit more predictable and it's a little uh, quicker. Um, and I, I, I definitely have seen that in my practice. So I do think it is a, a, a game changer. Fantastic. So let's move to um, audience questions. First question that came in, what percentage of lateral ankle stabilizations require intervention on perineal tendons? Why don't we work from left to right, Dr. Preisel? Yeah, um, I inspect them every time I look at them. If I'm doing a brostrum on the lateral side of the ankle, I'm going to look at the perineals. Um, I get MRIs on a lot of these patients uh, preoperatively. And what I've seen is that sometimes what happens is that the MRI pathology undercalls what we're actually seeing in the operating room. And so I don't have an exact number that's, that's literature-based, but in my experience when I'm doing brostrums, I'd probably say 40%, 50% of the time I'm addressing the perineal simultaneously with some sort of repair technique, but I'm looking at them 100% of the time. Sure. Dr. Katika, that consistent with your experience? Uh, yes. I think, you know, when you do any sort of lateral ligament reconstruction, I, I think you have to look at them 100% of the time. You're right there. You can definitely, definitely take a kind of a peek into the sheath, into the tendons. If you see any, uh, you know, large amount of tenosynovitic fluid, uh, then I'm going to, uh, you know, expose them. There's probably some underlying pathology. Um, as far as, uh, you know, how, how often uh, do you see, per uh, do you see perineal uh, problems? You know, I, it, it's high. I mean, the number is definitely, definitely high. I, I want to say in the literature, I think it's been reported up to 70% in some series. Um, but um, um, it's, it's 
they're, I mean, you got to think they're your lateral dynamic lateral stabilizers. So if you have these patients with chronic instability, um, uh, you, you definitely, definitely got to look for it. Yep. Dr. Neufeld, your experience on this? Uh, it's fairly frequent. I, I would, I would add that I see more often uh, low riding perineal brevis muscle. I see crowding the perineal groove. So I'll, I'll extend my incision. I'll take a peek. And if I see a low riding muscle, I'll, I'll tend to debride that 30% uh, of the time. Great. Uh, next question. What sizes of Artelon do you think are the ones to keep on hand? We talked about the fact that you don't always know exactly what you're in for until you're in the case. If, if you had one or two sizes that you wanted to keep on the shelf, ready to go, what would they be? Um, Dr. Neufeld, start with you. Um, I think for perineal tendons, I, I tend to use more of a three millimeter um, diameter because again, I try to keep the bulk really small. If I'm doing Achilles or anterior tibial work, um, I'll use a five millimeter. I don't, I don't use the seven millimeter very often. Great. Uh, in terms of length, Dr. Kataka, are the eight centimeters typically your go-to there? I think more often, I, I'd say the majority of the time, if you, um, for some reason, have, uh, you know, your perineal longus, perineal brevis, um, you know, problems with large, large tears, and hopefully you would know that on your MRI, you may need... Um, you may need a 16 or, or two eight, eight centimeters, but majority of the time, the eight centimeters is going to be enough. Great. And Dr. Prizel, you also tend towards the smaller sizes as well. Yeah. I think if you, if at your center, you only stock two sizes uh, for perineal work, I think the three millimeter by eight centimeter works great. And if you need something that's a little bit larger and you're going to be using it for multiple indications and you're only going to have one or two size available all the time in that five millimeter, what I would have there is the five by 16. Uh, probably because I use that some with the Achilles and I use it some for some uh, ligament reconstructions as well. Great. Uh, before we move to the questions, all of you attending the call will notice that a window popped up on the bottom uh, for more questions to book an expert. If you have further questions outside of this call, feel free to click this. Somebody from the company or one of our clinical experts will follow up with you and make sure that uh, all of your questions are answered. Um, next question about suture preference, absorbable or not absorbable. What are the pros and cons that we were looking at? Um, we talked about inflammation and that's how that pertains to resorbable suture. Um, Dr. Neufeld, take us through your thinking with what variety of suture to use. Sure. I, I, I like the idea that something's going to dissolve and the biology is going to take over at some point. So I, I tend not to use non-absorbable sutures if I can. So I prefer a PDS, uh, which lasts a little bit longer um, for these repairs. Yep. It is notable, that, you know, when the company gets asked this question, PDS is typically what we do recommend for those reasons. One is that it, it tends to last a little longer. Two is that it is uh, the method of degradation for PDS is hydrolysis like Artelon. So it tends to be a less inflammatory reaction than something like a Vicryl. Um, Dr. Prizel, any thoughts on resorbable, non-resorbable, your choice? Yeah. So in my learning curve with this product, I would say when I started using it initially, I would at least tack the ends down with a non-absorbable suture because uh, I wasn't yet fully fully sure of, of how confident I could be with the product. At this point, using it after using it several times in multiple applications, I've gotten away from that. And like what Steve said, I use, uh, use PDS most commonly with it either a 2 or 3 size, depending on where I'm at. Perfect. Next question is about vascularity. Um, any concerns about Artelon with you know, neovasculature in your repairs after the, the reconstruction is done? Uh, Dr. Kataka, are you still with us? I am. Um, so, you know, as far as vascularity, um, I think if you compare it to, um, you know, an allograft, a cadaveric allograft, I think a lot of, I mean, I, I, there's not a lot of uh, vas vascularity uh, with those, and a lot of that, you know, you, you get that kind of ne necrosis, uh, to, um, you know, afterwards on a cellular level too. Um, I don't see that with uh, um, happening with Artelon. I do think that's a good, you know, um, uh, uh, to be honest with you. So I, I no, I, that's not a, a, a something that I worry about actually. Sure, Dr. Neufeld, any thoughts on that? to dead tissue, uh, there's no vascularity at all for it. So uh, if your choice is a dead tissue or a tissue that's going to dissolve and retain its strength, 
throughout the five to six years, I would much rather use the art align. So uh, I'm not worried about it. And I also think uh, with the early motion you can achieve with art align, I think that promotes vascularization as well. Sure. And we actually, two weeks ago, had a webinar specifically on Artaline. It was fascinating because, I, you know, it sort of came out that it's, it's a little bit of the worst of both worlds, right? Because it doesn't have mechanical properties that are well matched to the tendons you're repairing. And it's also this dense you know, biological material that has to be cleared out to make room for new vasculature where Artaline was designed. We talked about the the design characteristics of Artalon, the porosity of that textile was very carefully considered so that uh, it had enough opening for new vasculature to, uh, to form. Um, next question, talking about the use of suture anchors versus the use of just suture to secure it. Um, I, I would assume this is kind of dealt by, by indication. Anybody want to jump on this one? Yeah, I think it uh, just depends on, uh, you know, where you're repairing. I mean, if uh, if you're doing a kind of inlay, onlay graft uh, of your perineal tendons, you typically won't need any uh, suture anchors. Uh, you just need suture. Um, if you are doing, uh, you know, if you, if you do have to tack it down to your fifth metatarsal base, you know, uh, in some cases, um, you probably need something to hold it down to the bone, whether it be a suture anchor, sometimes you can do a biotinodesis screw. Um, in your SPR uh, uh, reconstructions, um, uh, again, you need something to, to secure it uh, to the bone, uh, whether that be a suture anchor, whether that be a bio screw, um, or, or similar to Steve's technique. Sure. Dr. Prizel, anything to add there? Yeah, I've uh, not necessarily for perineal tendons. Uh, I haven't done the technique that Dan is describing for SPR. If I did it, I would use an interference screw. Uh, when I did it into the fibula. And I think that this material holds the, the resistance of an interference screw really nicely. And uh, that also helps decrease the bulk. I've used it a lot with my ligament reconstructions with it, but I haven't necessarily used it for tendon uh, work. In the fifth metatarsal base, I think uh, a small suture anchor works fine. And you don't really have an issue with bulk typically there, uh, more so than you would with the interference screw. Great. Uh, last question in the chat, uh, infection. What is the risk of inserting a big foreign body such as Artelon? Dr. Neufeld, what are your thoughts on that as it pertains to infection specifically? Yeah, uh, my thoughts are that I don't think it increases the risk significantly. It's, it's sterile. Uh, it has, uh, as far as I know, no incidence of increasing infection. The bulk is much smaller than it would be with an allograft. And uh, again, I wrap the biology around it typically. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't replace the skin, it replaces the deep tendon. So I've not seen any troubles with foreign body reactions or infection using Artelon. Great. And that's consistent with what we heard from Dr. Prizel and Dr. Kadeka, uh earlier. Uh, it is worth noting that yeah, I, I do have to take exception with the term foreign body as it applies to Artelon, because one thing that the preclinical research clearly showed is that there's not a foreign body reaction to Artelon in a healing site. Uh, generally is not recognized. So there's not giant cell activity. There's not, you know, encapsulation or, uh, you know, phagocytosis of that material. It's just sort of benignly embedded within the, the developing tissues. So, well, we are right at one hour. Um, I'd like to thank our attendees for joining our call. Um, to all of you, the handouts on the right on that tab, um, these case studies, uh, you know, several of these were developed by our panelists here today. A lot of work went into them, and they give you a lot more detail on the actual surgical techniques. Uh, I'd like to give a sincere, sincere thank you to our three panelists, Dr. Mark Preisel, Dan Katika, and Steve Neufeld for joining us tonight. We appreciate their uh, expertise and their guidance, and uh, I would volunteer my own time as well as their time to answer any further questions that our attendees may have. Um, so with that, I think we are going to adjourn the call. Thank you all for your time and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.